and thank you for coming. And I'm Susan Schultz. I'm here with Ashley Wilson, who is the latest member of the leadership team. I think all of you heard, but it's worth saying one more time. Todd is actually at the, the World Innovation Conference in Bilbao, Spain. So he will not be joining us today, um, but he'll be here in spirit. So what we do for those of you that are new is we, we do a, a beef brief introduction discussion um, before we get into our main speaker, who is Paul Hare, uh, who we're really excited to have tonight. And you'll hear a little bit more about him after we go through our stuff here. So our mission really is to create this, this place where we can innovate and learn about how to be better entrepreneurs and really provide everyone with the tools knowledge, leadership, and confidence to really grow the, their businesses, whether it's a startup or a full business. And we have a lot of community links, so we'll figure out how to put those into the chat, but come look at our website. We've got a YouTube channel where we post the videos from the speakers who have given us permission to do that. We have a newsletter, we have a Slack channel. So bring friends, bring fellow people. They don't have to be HBAPers and uh, let them join us. And then unless the speaker says otherwise, we do post the recordings publicly. And then our code of conduct is really to support that safe place, right? Where people can come and and speak about what they're doing. People can come and test their ideas and get feedback and, and learn from each other. So all rights are reserved by the presenter. And we follow, of course, the honor code on ethical behavior and follow the feedback approach, which um, for those of you that were here when Josh Krieger was here, he said that's not the way it's done with economists, but the way we do it is um, for every, every piece of tart, feedback, we give five pieces of sweet and positive feedback because that's the best way for people to learn and get better. So upcoming, we've got a lot of exciting upcoming people talking in the next few weeks. Um, so we have Neville Boston, who's the founder of Reviver, which is the first electronic license plate company and you can do a lot of really cool things with an electronic license plate. Then we're having Thanksgiving break. Then we have the second session with Josh Krieger where four teams are gonna be presenting how they used Josh's model and approach and their findings and their takeaways. Then we have Gloria Govan who is the founder. She's an actress, but she's also the founder of Relentless Brands which is a full cycle cannabis company from the horticulture through to the retail. And then as we do every year, we have a holiday party and Paul, you are absolutely invited to come. Um, we just wear something festive, which is often things like antler headdresses and things like that. And we just have a nice discussion. And then on the 27th, no call, it's a holiday. Okay, so I don't know if we have any new folks. Do we have any new folks? Ashley, do you see any new folks? I am looking through. I think I mostly see familiar faces tonight. I think so too. Okay, all right. So then uh, before we get to the main event, we're gonna do quick breakout rooms and uh, just have a nice chat. You can talk about what are you looking to do and how can you help each other or just have a good chat. And Ashley, you're gonna move everybody in, right?
Susan, you just stay back with me. Yep. Awesome. I'm just taking a glance through the list and making sure no one got assigned on their own. We had an uneven number. And we still have two people to put in. Yeah, I think they maybe either joined a little later, didn't accept, but let me let me check. Hi there. I just joined. Hi, Lilith. Hi, Susan. How are you? Good. How are you? I'm doing well, thank you. Good. Hey, Bill. Can you stick? Okay, no one's in alone. So I've confirmed awesome. that. And I did have to create a, another room where I put three. Okay, nice. Hey, Ardiana. Hi, Susan. How are you? Good. How are you? Doing well. Hey, Ardiana. How are you? Hi, Ashley. How are you? Do you want me to drop you into a breakout room or you want to hang out here with us in the lobby? Yeah, I, you know, I can stay here. Okay. okay. <laughs> no problem. So yeah, I think Susan, that went pretty well. A couple did wind up with three, um, but I don't think there was like adequate time to, yeah, you know, reorg. But there's nine active okay. rooms. Okay. Yeah. And I have a tech question for you. So when I look at the chat, can you can you see me looking at it, like right now? No. Okay. I just see. I mean, I can see your URL, but I don't see um, anything else happening on your screen. Got it. Okay. And I don't know how to collapse that stuff. Um, okay, cool. And great. You put the, um, you put the links in. I see them. The links for from the presentation. I put this into chat. Yep, I saw that. Cool. So when we're gonna share Paul's, I have to give him permission, right? How do I do that? Permission to share. Do you know? Well, he could share when he joined us, right? Yeah. Okay. So he's already got permission. Cool. All right. My um, but well, I think time's running out on the rooms. Um, and okay. I'm gonna close them now. Okay.
Oh, that's so fun. Paul was in with Kelly and Farzan. That's so fun. <laughs> I never knew on this side of it that you could lurk and 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 exchange people and see uh and and even pop in um to each run. That's that's nice. That's cool. So three, two, one, and we'll be welcoming everyone back from their breakout rooms. A few more coming in, Susan, and then I think you can go back into the rest of the formalities. Okay, great. Let's see. Yep, looks like we've got pretty much everybody and Paul is back too. All right. So just a reminder before we get to the main event, um, when you leave, when you leave the call at the end, there's a survey, please fill it out. You know, we love data and we get sad without it. So, so fill out the survey and then uh, we'll do overtime afterwards and we'll stop recording after that. And so overtime is always fun. Paul, you're welcome or not. We just, we chat about a whole range of topics and it's very, it's very fun. Sounds fun. All right. So now I have the great honor to introduce tonight's speaker, Paul Hare. And he is the inaugural executive director of Harvard Grid. And he leads the creation of new programs to accelerate the pace of startup formation at Harvard. So it's really cool to have you here tonight since we are heavily into that ourselves. So he was appointed in 2022 and oversees a fast growing initiative comprising educational outreach, innovation development, mentoring programs, alumni engagement, and physical space for emerging ventures. He's a transformational leader. And if you look him up on LinkedIn, you can truly see all of the things that he's done but he has a really good record of turning early and growth stage concepts into world-class businesses. He's founded technology companies, medical device startups with two exits and designed and founded high growth divisions in multinational companies. So he most recently has been focused on medical devices and novel healthcare delivery models. And we have a lot of people here that are very interested in the healthcare industry. Uh, and then previously looked at things in the solar industry, chemicals, corporate food solution sectors. And so his expertise spans M&A, global strategy, long-term value creation, data analytics, and executive development. And interestingly, he's been raised by two lifelong educators. And so he invests generally and generously in people and communities serving as an advisor and director at numerous startups, private companies, nonprofits, incubators, and student organizations. He's also deeply committed and engaged as an advisor to students, alumni, and leaders in higher ed. He holds a BS from elect in electrical engineering from Cornell and an MBA from Harvard Business School. So without further ado, as is our custom, Let's all briefly unmute and give Paul a hand. Hey. Sorry, we got where you met. <laughs> Yay. Welcome, welcome. Yay. Love that. That is really awesome. <laughs> welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Um, that is a super sweet and probably the most cordial welcome that I've had. Thank you, uh, Susan. Thanks uh, for <laughs> suffering the pain of having to read through that. Um, if nothing else, I think the takeaway is that has to be, I have to dramatically shorten that. Uh, it's it's late here for all the East Coasters, and I hope nobody fell asleep after the introduction. I hope we're all, we're all good. No, no reflection, Susan, on delivering it. But Susan, Ashley, and Todd in absentia, thank you so much for um, putting this together. All, all your hard work brought us together and very grateful for that. Very grateful for the invitation to come speak to this illustrious group. And I have to say, you know, um, if I speak out of school, if anything sounds crazy, you can blame Kelly Kimball. He's taught me everything that I know. Uh, he's become a dear friend in a short time um, with his work uh, helping Decubed uh, and the HBAP uh, alumni program sort of uh, continue to build and grow into uh, bigger and better things. So, um, Kelly, it's great to see you. And by the way, he is, if you ask him to turn on his uh, his camera, because we need to harass him a bit, given where we are and where he nice. is. 
So we'll make him <laughs> suffer a little bit later. <laughs> Since he's in such he's in paradise at the moment. And of course, Divya Reddy, also a friend that I've come to know. We serve on a, a, a committee um, together at uh, at D-Cubed as well. So it's nice to see you, Divya. And a few familiar faces. I have the thrill to have been on this call twice um, before. So this is my third. So maybe I could have figured something out by now. So we'll see how the conversation goes. But I hope this will be um, casual, informal. Would love to have anyone interrupt at any point, which is perfectly fine. Uh, and then, you know, we'll, if not, we'll get to questions and, and discussion also uh, at the end. Um, it's going to be a little bit of stream of consciousness. I thought that might be a little bit more fun than a nice tied up presentation. So I uh, hope uh, that format will work. Um, but we will uh, we'll see. You can let me know at the end. And in the spirit of um, five to one, I, I'm happy with the opposite ratio, but I absolutely welcome <laughs> feedback and ideas. And in fact, you'll forgive me, but I do hope to have you work uh, tonight a little bit because um, part of what we're, we're doing, and you'll see this, is that we're also inventing. Uh, the you know We're trying to figure out how to do what we are charged to do. Um, so I'm going to show you ideas and you know, talk through the ideas with you, but I absolutely would welcome, uh, you know, push on them, make sure that they're... Uh, they, they make sense to you and, and tell me what else that we're missing or should be doing. Stop doing, uh, start doing and uh, do more of. You'll see that's exactly what I'll ask at the very end. So uh, let's, uh, let's, let's jump into it. Let me do a sh screen share. If I did the right screen share, you should see a full screen now. Is that true? Just thumbs up maybe? It works. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you. So um happy to be in front of this illustrious group, you know, so, you know, it's really about startups, but, uh, but, as I like to say, in thinking about what the grid uh, is is doing and what we hope to do, maybe the real title of this talk is that a Harvard PhD chemist and a Harvard PhD bio, uh, biophysiologist walk into a bar, uh, and what happens next is really the focus and the and the uh, the outcome and the out, uh, the output, the intended output um, of the Harvard grid. But first, why why is this crazy guy wasting your time? Um, and maybe what I thought just to, to peel back a little bit of some of the stuff that. Uh, we heard earlier um, in terms of career and what I've done uh, over time, um, it's been varied. So I started doing IT right out of uh, undergrad. I went into strategy consulting right after uh, business school, then did my first startup in food delivery, then worked in private equity for a while, then did early stage and high efficiency crystal silicon solar, trying to get more electrons out of photons fundamentally from solar panels. Um, and then for the last decade, medical devices, uh, and then now working across many engineering and scientific disciplines um, at the uh, at Harvard School of Engineering and Applied Sciences, you know, across uh, many different sectors to try to translate ideas. And basically, as you heard, an electrical engineering degree and an MBA, what does that give me a license to do? It's a fill in the blank. And that's kind of a question. And, you know, it, it, if you look at the map, it, um, you might think that it's sort of a grand plan because it looks like a very linear thing. You might be able to draw a, th a thread. But the, the truth is, is that if you look behind the curtain in the wizard of, in the spirit of the Wizard of Oz, um, it hit my career and my life has been sort of an absolute pinball. Um, Farzan and I were uh, with Kelly, we're just chatting about that. You know, um, when you're working in a job and you might have inspirations to do um, something that's earlier stage or do your own startup, you know, how, how does what's the, uh, the what's the the pudding and, you know, what's the pudding look like or how do you make the pudding? Um, and this is what it really looks like. And what I would ask, you know, what I would say is that the truth of the matter is, is that, you know, I, I'm sort of mid-career or later, I don't know how to describe it, but I still don't know what I want to be when I grow up. Um, but one request, and, and, you know, maybe we can cut this from the recording, but please don't tell my wife I said that, because every time I say that to her, she um, she always says that I no longer, at my stage in life, I no longer should be uh, saying that, but I hope that I will continue to say that until um, I'm not really able to do anything else, which is what I want to be when I grow up. Anyway, there you go. Finish. So that's sort of the background. Um, and so I, I I would love to say that what's brought me to what I'm doing now has made a lot of sense and it's been a, a grand plan. But I think uh, you have seen uh, the the you've seen the man behind the curtain, as it were. So let's let's shift gears and talk about what my day job is. Um, so that's uh, might be a little bit more interesting and maybe the focus of our discussion today. The Harvard Grid. So it didn't exist a year ago. I joined the university to launch it. And its explicit objective um, is to uh, work with, uh, so let me just read what's here. So, you know, what is it that we hope to do? Um, you kind of heard it in what Susan said, to accelerate the pace of translation of science and engineering at Harvard. So, you know, from our science and engineering labs, how do we um, anticipate doing that? And the idea is we will work with faculty and researchers in their labs 
to help shape their work and get them out to market to have impact um, when they're so inclined to do so. Um, and the, and the, the purpose, you know, why do we want to do that? Is that we think there's a um, we do translation well here at Harvard, but we think there's a deeper well that with the right support, with the right mentoring, with the right inputs uh, and um, sort of village, as it were, that um, there's an opportunity to have a much bigger impact that we're having to lift more ideas from our labs and and the intent, therefore, is to elevate global society. And, um, you know, so one, one little moniker here, we talk about science and engineering, you're going to hear me say maybe tough tech. That's also sort of how we describe our focus. Um, and so that explicitly is the purpose of the grid is that there's a lot of um, there's a lot of uh, uh, healthcare, um, bio, life science research also that goes on. Um, there's a medical school and there's a, a there's an expansive hospital system, uh, teaching hospital system connected to the medical school as well. Um, but I think Harvard recognized that there's an opportunity to to sort of dig deeper or to to you know uh, dip the the, uh, the bucket deeper in the well of science and engineering. So that is explicitly the focus of the grid. Um, sorry, I jumped ahead a little bit. And sort of the three key pillars of how we might, you know, translate the how is sort of building a community that, uh, you know, to sort of shine the translational aspect of community and have there be a venturing community uh, in the engineering and applied sciences. Um, curate ideas, you know, that's uh, at the very early stage, but also throughout their life cycle. You know, we, we, we talk about this notion of chasms. There are actually many chasms uh, that entrepreneurs or, you know, early teams face when they're trying to build ideas. So this idea of curation, and that's many steps in that curation. Um, and then launch. Uh, there's uh, one of the chasms, even after ideas get their early funding, um, they're, they're almost like chicks in a nest. You know, the mother bird kicks them out early. That's how it is at Harvard. It, for a lot of legal reasons, candidly, for instance, if you have a license um, and you're now a for-profit entity, that doesn't jive with what uh, an academic institution is. Um, they are uh, legally structured as nonprofits and when we take grants from the government that's designed to do work to generate IP that the school will own, um, but we have to be faithful to those grants and they, there can't be a commercial or distracting element to them. So there's lots of reasons why even at the point of license or even at the point of getting um, modest uh, seed funding that there's still support right around that uh, that that time point of launch. You know, if we, if, and if we look at the context at Harvard, um, and maybe some of these organizations are familiar to you, um, the circle is kind of the things that uh, exist at Harvard to support the idea of tough tech venturing. So there's many on here that you, you may recognize, you know, right across the street are the innovation labs and the life lab um, within this building that I sit. I sit in Harvard's new science and engineering building, by the way. Um, next time you visit campus, if you have the opportunity, please save a little time to come by and let me know. Um, we'd love to have coffee or lunch and show you around, but really it's, it's, I, I don't exaggerate, it's an inspiration walking in this building, how beautiful it is architecturally and um, what happens in this building as well. And there's other organizations. I, I mentioned the Cubed. Um, there's different fellowship programs. There's the Rock Center at HBS that's focused on uh, entrepreneurship, both for students and alums. Um, and as I mentioned, within the building, we have the Tech Center for Entrepreneurship. So bottom line, without uh, getting lost in a lot of these logos and icons, is that there, there are sort of pockets of entrepreneurism and, and supporting uh, ventures um, throughout the university and then several without, you know, these are programs that our alums have been through that they, uh, we have very consistent information that these are big and they're very impactful, easy to access um, and often don't cost anything. So those things are sort of ingredients that we, um, we, we build into our mission of not having the pride of authorship. We don't have to build the program. So it's important to understand um, what there is available both within and without Harvard, and then make sure that they are easily accessible to our community here in a way that can really accelerate the work that they're they're working on. So I think the real key takeaway is here is that we don't want to replicate what exists. We want to plug in what exists and um, you know be a bit of be a bit curatorial in what we uh, we showcase to our community, um, in that we know it will have impact and we know that um, someone has been through it and can sort of validate the idea. Some other things that we do as an example is this idea of being visible and present. You know, this is a, we live in a hybrid world now, but um, I physically am in the uh, science and engineering complex every single day, early and late. And the idea is my door, like a faculty members would be open. Um, I, I do walk into labs, I go to lab meetings. We have a litany of events and we'll, I'll show you some of those here shortly as well. Um, but the idea is, is being physical and present. I go to, I've never been to a PhD defense until I started this gig. And, you know, I don't know, you know, some of you may have PhDs as well, but the idea of, um, you know, participating in that, that's really a, um, that's a big, um, 
don't want to say transaction, but that's that's sort of a that's a big pivot point in the life of a person's career. Um, and and in an academic environment, the 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 bestowing of a PhD is a very big uh, um, life milestone. So you know, being at these defenses, uh, being able to participate in them with you know the faculty committee um, and also with other students that are there to support those that are going to be conferred PhDs. Um, it's a big deal, I think, in this idea about how we build community because that's a very difficult thing to measure and you could spend a lot of activity and time trying to do that, but um, uh, you want to do it in a way that um, it, it, you can try to see the uh, the impact relatively quickly, but also sort of lasting and, uh, and, and create something that um, is sustainable. Um, lots of programs, we do lots of events, they're educational, um, they're, they're designed to build community. We bring in people from the outside uh, to bring ideas to the table here so that our researchers can sort of broaden the way they think about things, notably application and market. Um, we bring lots of people uh, to share their experiences because we don't need to reinvent wheels. What we need to do is make wheels spin faster. So again, in this, there's this very clear theme about no pride of authorship. And so if people have done it before, um, we'd rather bring that in and try to figure out how to do it ourselves um, from, from the ground up. Um, different themes, we focused on things like uh, inclusive design, um, it may startle some of you as it did me that automobiles are, as an example, are 70% less safe for a tr traditional female anatomy than they are for a traditional male anatomy. Um, and that's simply because that's an engineering flaw in how automobiles are both built and tested. And so we, we sort of looked at that problem of, you know, where in its life cycle um, did these, these failings happen and how can they be addressed? Um, We've done deep dives on technologies that are important to our community, like uh, augmented reality and virtual reality, both looking at it at the, de at the device lens, because we do everything from optics sensors to edge computing, to AI, to you know, dig uh, image processing, digital signal processing. I mean, the, the, the sort of wide array of what, what is necessary to build the headset as an example, and to have that headset you know, deliver something that is visually impactful to um, someone that might be wearing it. Um, there are a lot of disciplines that that cross traditional areas of research. So I think that's one thing that's a very exciting about the engineering school at Harvard is that we don't have departments. We do have areas. So there's, you know, something that might be reminiscent of, um, of departments, but we have areas and that that is designed by intention. And that's clearly to sort of communicate the idea and messages that, you know, we uh, what the work that we do almost always is going to be um, cross disciplinary and collaborative if we're really going to have the impact that we'd like to have. But, um, but back to the thematic, so like uh, we looked at both looking at the hardware aspect of AR, VR technologies, but also the applications, you know, where is their resonance or traction in commercial applications, where are the resonance in consumer applications, and what are the big players doing um, to turn these technologies into something that uh, can change society. We have a small space here, um, and we give out uh, grants, you know, I have a small purse, um, which is a great privilege, and we use those as de-risking grants, so the idea is um, we invite um, proposals from uh, the entire community, and the, it's very simple what we look for. We just look for projects that, with funding and the support from the grid, um, in one year's time could be de-risk de enough to where they may be a warm and receptive body on the outside world, notably a venture capitalist who's willing to write a check. So think of them as de-risking grants to make ideas fundable is one way to think about de-risking. Um, and then, you know, sort of our plans for the future, and I'm gonna, uh, we'll get into that in a, in a moment. Um, if I may, I'll just jump into some of the, the uh, events and series that we've launched, and largely because I'd love to share with you sort of how these ideas manifest in sort of activities or, you know, actions that are on our, our game plan, and, um, and then ask for your ideas. Like, are, are these things likely to hit the mark? Are these things likely to move the needle in the way that we would measure as important, um, or are they sort of just activities that are consuming time and attention that maybe not, um, you know, helping us succeed in terms of what we're trying to do as we showed very early on in the discussion. Um, one of the series that we launched is this Lab to Launch Lounge. And I think fundamentally this idea that if you see yourself in something, it's it, if you see yourself in a, in a successful way um, in something that you'd like to do, it's a lot easier to make the, the next couple of leaps. So we bring Harvard PhDs back to the, the SEC here, the Science and Engineering Complex, if I use that acronym. Um, we bring Harvard PhDs back to uh, the SEC. And these are PhDs that not only um, did fabulous research here, but they got their research, they wanted to launch with their research, got it VC funded, and they now serve in a CXO role. So they come back and they talk about that, that founder story. 
Um, and we really focus in on the, where did you get the inspiration that you wanted to launch with your work? Um, when you lifted your head up from your bench, let's say at G2, G3, you know, the second or third year of your PhD as an example, um, why did you not just put your head back down and focus on your work? You know, what was it that that drew you? I mean, wh what barriers were there and how did you overcome them to say there is a path here for me to follow and I'm going to sort of build this idea into something that I can launch as a startup and I want to you know, serve in a leadership role and, and, uh, and take somebody else's money and build a team to do so. So that's those are exactly the kinds of things that we focus on. So that the path, you know, this think of it as almost shining a light on the path to make it bright, to make it evident, to make uh, prevent, provide several examples, and um, sort of lower the activation uh, energy required to get that lift, as it were. Here's an example of how they work. Um, so in some cases I moderate them, but in most cases, um, uh, Nicole Black is an example. I'll call her out by name because she is. Harvard's PhD who took some of her work in 3D um, biomaterials printing, um, light, uh, took that out as a license and uh, got it funded and sold in less than 18 months. So it's a pretty quick and remarkable story. And she is wildly generous with her time and insights and experience. So we invite her back to moderate these. Um, and this is sort of the format. They're designed to be informal. The reason we call it lounge, a lab to launch lounge, is that we want to create that you know casual intimateness um, so that you can ask whatever question that might be on your mind um, to someone who really was in your shoes and in potentially even in your lab, not you know four or five years uh, recently. Another series is our lab to market series. And this is, think of it as sort of um, ask anything you want of three serial entrepreneurs. Um, it happened today, actually, um, 12 to noon, uh, 12 to two, pardon, um, in our node, which is the space that I mentioned. Um, we have at least three serial entrepreneurs that sit around a table. We bring in pizza and drinks and we invite anyone to drop in or drop out um, however their schedules permit and ask any question that's on their mind. So what is a cap table? How do I incorporate? When is the right time to think about spending my research out? Or what does it need to look like before a venture capitalist might be interested in funding the idea? Is VC the only way for me to get this idea funded? Um, what does a license look like with a major university and how does that look like um, with my PI, my faculty member, and or um, you know an external party that hopes to lift it. So um, no experience required. Sit at a table, grab a slice of pizza, and ask anything you want from three serial entrepreneurs that are also, um, at least half of us are angel investors as well. And this is what that looks like. This is our node. Um, by the way, one thing I'll say about the physical space is that it's surrounded on three sides. It's actually outfitted as a wet lab space, but it's surrounded on three sides by windows. And we look out to a large open field that soon will be what Harvard is calling its enterprise research campus. In two years, there's going to be 2 million additional square feet of residential research and uh, commercial space um, that's on the other side of the building that you see right here. Um, and then across the street is the Harvard Innovation Lab, and right behind that is the Harvard Business School. So this idea of the intersection of um, business and engineering is, is something, as someone who has an engineering undergrad and an MBA, is something that uh, I should be able to figure out and figure out how to make, make this road disappear between the disciplines. Another idea, you know, shockingly, this is Harvard, right? Uh, and shockingly, in my first month, so I joined in August, we launched the grid in September of last year, and Harvard put out a press release, and a PhD student came to me, he was a fifth year PhD student, and he came to me and he said, I read this press release about the Harvard grid, and I have been searching and largely using Google to find the, vent the entrepreneurship or venturing community at Harvard, and there is no nexus, I can't find a place to go or people to meet, you know, one single place. Um, and we can come back to that if you'd like, because there are, there are other organizations that have been trying to crack that nut, you know, but, you know, very specifically in the science and engineering, the comment was, where do I go to find this community? So in partnership with all these other organizations, we reached out and we said, we need to have a monthly unstructured, you know, we'll provide beer, wine and food, uh, a place for people just to come together, find co-founders, potentially find investors, find others that just might support them in their, in their venturing journey. Um, and get ideas lifted uh, faster and better and bigger, again, in the spirit of it taking a village. So that's what this is. Venturing at Harvard is a monthly event. All three of these, by the way, the Lab to Market, um, the Lab to Market series, the Lab to Launch Lounge series, and the Venturing at Harvard series are all monthly events um, because we want to build this cadence where if you, depending on what you need, there should you should be able to find exactly where to go to find the answer or to find exactly what you need. So that's kind of the spirit behind setting these up. 
So this is what it looks like. You know, sometimes there are uh, smaller events in the lobby of uh, Pierce Hall, which is uh, one of the engineering buildings on, on the main Cambridge campus. Um, it might be a larger event in the SEC where in the Layman program, this is Sam McGee, he runs the Layman program. It's an undergraduate program focused on the education of entrepreneurship. So they're not as rigorous in the idea that you have to have a really tight business plan with all the traditional pieces that some of us may say, you know, as we look at it, that, that may be missing. But the, the idea is to take, take an idea, whatever inspires you, and let's go through the journey of trying to put that together in a way and in a plan that might make sense. Um, and so we sort of piggyback the venturing at Harvard at different sort of um, touch points uh, that already exist at the university so that we can bring together a broader community so that when your poster's up, um, a much broader set of people will find it, not only just other students, but you'll find um, investors, people who want to join a venture uh, as co-founders, you'll find business students, you'll find uh, 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 analytics students, you'll find engineering students, you'll find uh, theology students, you'll find out, you know, sort of much more broader walks of uh, folks that will come talk to you about what you're doing and what you, you did in your time uh, in the program. Hey, Paul. Yes. Those are wonderful. Are they open to HBAPers as well? You know, Susan, it's a great question. And we, by design for what we do, the grid is focused on um, science and engineering, but because of these programs, we open them to the Harvard community. So um, they are less designed as alumni activities, but I'll say this, is that all of these events are on our website and something like the venturing event, um, we have invited uh, lots of the alums to them because again, in order to accomplish the purpose of it, having alums there makes them richer. So let me say this, I'm the bouncer and I'm uh, not very bulky. So um, we would cordially invite you. All of these dates, times, locations are on our website. And if you're in the Boston area and on campus, would absolutely love to have you because it would improve the character and our mission at each one of these events. You'll see that it says for the Harvard community, but that's really a moniker for a lot of more legal reasons than anything else we have to put on. <laughs> Thank you for the question. And I, I think I mentioned this, I won't get into a detail, but you know, we will do a deep dive on this idea of um, inclusive design. Um, why are there uh, gender bias? That's sort of how we've looked at this, uh, this inclusion bias, um, this gender bias in the design. And by the way, I committed, you know, unwittingly, let me say this, uh, and I'll, I'll admit this to this group, which is, I committed the same sin. One of the medical devices that I uh, that my team developed was a um, skin grafting device. And in designing it, what we did is I wasn't on the engineering team. I was on the on the clinical and business and market side of the. Uh, this was after my MBA, so that's what I've always focused on. Is all on the market side of technical ideas of how to get these uh, ideas out to, to to markets to solve problems, and the way we developed the skin grafting device. So we would harvest skin and then deposit skin in, in for the care of chronic wounds, um, uh, potentially for burns as well, for burn patients. And the way we developed the device is that we would start in our labs and the engineering team would develop the device. And they took inspiration from existing devices. So it almost looked like a nail gun. If you have ever been to a Home Depot or if you uh, like to do a lot of DIY stuff at home, think of it as a nail gun. So, you know, a little bit, it, it's a bulky device. It has a pretty big grip. Um, and it uh, it shoots out nails, and so it's 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 a bit heavy in girth and, and size and grip. It's it's you know it's a bit bulky, and so we developed this. And the way that we tested it is I took it to a cadaver lab. Now I'm a six two you know skinny guy with a very big uh, palm and finger grip, and with long arms, which means I was relatively easily able to get my hand around the grip. I was relatively easily to manipulate to where most tissue is harvested, harvested, which is the upper thigh on the human anatomy. And then I was very easily able to manipulate the device around to where most chronic wounds are. Many are extremity wounds. So they end to be end up being sort of lower leg, ankle, even foot. And um, I was to able to manipulate it around to different you know, portions or you know, move the human body in a way you know, with one hand while manipulating our nail gun or our skin grafting device to deposit that skin. But what I ended up doing was designing a device that was really easy to use and had a great user interface for someone who looked like me and that was designed by me. And as it turns out, that's a very small segment of what a surgeon looks like today. And in fact, one design, one, uh, the second installment of this inclusion by design discussion, we had um, female surgeons come talk to us and they showed us pictures of how they've had to manipulate. I mean, one was a um, 
four foot nine woman. Um, and, you know, her hand, you can imagine, was dramatically smaller than mine. So my device would never have worked in her hands. And she was absolutely in the center of my target demographic who, who would be using the device. So complete miss on my part in many regards. This is what the, the events look like. So, you know, we look at um, protective equipment. Uh, you see a firefighter here. We look at the design of automobile and automobile safety. This is a crash test dummy. We look at surgical equipment and we try to make it um, uh, interactive as well. So we bring people together. We have, um, we have breakout groups and the next installment here will actually be a hack where we hope to have a medical device. And we're gonna actually ask the teams to come up with different designs and we'll have members from the company on hand to uh, sort of talk to us about what it needs to do and who will be using it. And then we will uh, hack the design as it were. So that's TBD, to, to, to come uh, in the near future. And I've already mentioned the ARVR, so we do a deep dive on different topics again that are relevant to our community. Um, this was largely driven by students. And I'll, I'll ask this of you guys. One thing that I was really surprised about, we did a three-day symposium. On the first day, we looked all around Harvard and said, who is doing any kind of ARVR research? And we asked, um, uh, the, the idea was that we would give researchers around Harvard to come give a five minute flash talk on the work they're doing so we could build community of those that are using this technology in different ways. Now, let me ask you, where, um, as biased as I am, I just assumed we were doing the most ARV or work here in the engineering school. So where, but that wasn't the answer. Where do you think the most ARV or work uh, research was going on at Harvard University? Any ideas? Go ahead, speak out. Anyone can speak out. Where do you think it was happening? Medical school. There was a, a there's a center for ARV research here. That is exactly right, but it wasn't the most, believe it or not. Liberal arts, maybe? <laughs> yes, well, let's, let's go with that. Uh, it was in the School of Education. Mm. This idea of doing, you know, and, and if you think about it, we, we talked about that, right? Um, that um, one of the... Um, Oh, no, sorry. I just came from a session uh, by our dean at the business school across the street. And there was a woman that was in AMP uh, 199, which was the class of 2001. And she said we were the first class that had a digital full that had a fully digital experience. So that was just my limited thinking. I mean, the truth be told, the idea of um, AR using a different term, but, you know, like using um CBT, right? Computer-based uh, learning or technologies, right? We all, we're familiar with that. You know, that those are, these are different forms of AR. And so ed, the ed school was really one of the leaders in research. And of the 10, we had five slots that were from the ed school. So again, I, I have been schooled many times since I've been here and I hope to continue to be schooled in many ways as well. And anyway. I want to Make sure I give credit um, to Roland, who got that right in the chat. Um, oh, right. I'm sorry, Roland. I, I'm not watching the chat. Thank you. That's exactly right. <laughs> nice job. Roland, I need your help <laughs> as we build these next things. So this is what it looked like. This is where we had um, different researchers. I, I assume you can see my mouse. Um, on the upper left, uh, sorry, upper right, you can see um, this is a presentation from the visual, visualization lab. We actually have a... Um, a very impressive viz lab where uh, the guy that directs it in his office, he has every VR headset that's been launched from the beginning. And another thing that's remarkable, if you walk into his office and look on the shelf, and by the way, there's probably 80 uh, VR headsets on, um, on mannequin heads on his shelf. And you know what the first observation you'll make is? There has been, they look very similar. There has been very, there's been remarkably insignificant evolution of this technology, basically since the first one came out 20 or 30 years ago. Because the idea is certainly not you. In fact, maybe 30 or 40 years ago. Yeah, I'm sure you'd correct me. Um, so we had, we, we checked out VR headsets from the library, part of the luxury of being at a place like Harvard. So we checked out all the headsets of the library. And thanks to the Harvard AR VR Developers Club, who managed this, um, this is Alice right here. Um, she's the president of it. Um, and uh, so people got to try them on and try some of the apps that the, the ARVR club had uh, had developed. Um, I'm going to go a little faster. I'm sorry. You can tell I get animated when I talk about the work we do here, but I'm going to maybe speed it up a little bit. Um, we did a, a Tough Tech boot camp recently. Kelly Kimball was there. Um, and so it was great to have him there. Uh, he actually um, made contributions at, at the right time. 
which we were very grateful to have because this idea of experience and bringing that experience to the table so we you know maybe can short circuit some ideas and, and get to faster and better um, models uh, is is really what it's about. But we had a tough tech startup a boot camp where it was uh, nine to five on a Saturday on a beautiful sunny day in Boston in August. And guess what? We had a packed room. Not a single person fell asleep and not a single person left until the end of the day. In fact, people that were walking by um, stuck their heads in and stayed. So the the uh, event grew, you know, sort of standing room only. It grew by the end. Um, it was taught but largely by HBS faculty. We had a, a, a venture capitalist that's what on our uh, our grid accelerator uh, um, selection committee for our grants. Also give a talk. He actually happened to be the founder of um, e-ink, which is the technology behind Amazon's Kindle. So, um, you know, he was largely talking as a founder than he than he was as a venture capitalist. And we're gonna we're now sort of um, inverting that into a climate tech startup boot camp. Um, so we're gonna tailor it to because that's one of the two priorities of our dean. Our dean happens to be um, a researcher and lecturer um, on AI and blockchains, and um, he's going to uh, uh, he's prioritized uh, two key sort of broad sectors. One is AI, and one is climate. So you'll see a lot more on what we do in the climate space um, from the grid as well. Here's the uh, the startup boot camp, and by the way, you'll recognize two faces. Um, Tom Eisenman uh, gave a presentation here for the HBAP uh, startups, and so did Josh Krieger. He, uh, two two sessions ago, and maybe two sessions hence, uh, you heard from Susan. He's going to be actually um, inviting the four teams to give the results of applying his framework uh, to the idea of first application. And by the way, I have seen many presentations and. Let me just say, it's these guys that wrote the book and this kind of thing, and you've already seen them in action. And when, when they lecture, um, like Josh's feet, if you could see his feet in this picture, they don't touch the ground. Uh, and that's the kind of enthusiasm, that's the kind of authority, it's the kind of expertise um, that they bring to the table. It's another real pr privilege of being here. So when we did this boot camp, I just walked across the street and asked the tough tech, you know, Gurus to uh, if they would come and 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 let and you know be faculty for this uh, tough tab boot camp and the answer was absolutely yes and they gave us an entire day on a Saturday and so you know part of what we're doing also is that we we're building teams um, it it you know mentoring in pairs but also launching ideas it's not a single you know this Mark Mark Zuckerberg idea that we see in movies where you're in your dorm room and you launch this uh, billion dollar multi billion dollar unicorn that's really not the case and I think those of us that have tried this know that that. Um, it takes a village, and that's exactly what the big grid is trying to do. So that's grid 1.0, um, kind of talking about what we're doing, where we are, where are we headed. Um, we're looking at uh, launching two uh, two programs, a fellowship program and an internship. One is the innovation interns. We would love to give undergraduates more exposure to the translation of science and engineering because it's a very different animal than like uh, a consumer app or B2B software or you know cloud software, whatever it might be. Those are very different animals than the translation of hard science and technology. You know, the, the, most notably is that there's you, you might need some aspect of IP or protection. You need to develop something that is unique and novel, um, and often that's something physical. Um, second, they take a lot more time to go from you know even if you sort of de-risk the science, the development part. So you know, sort of de-risking a prototype or you know something that could start to look like a commercial product. Um, there's often work that needs to be done and you need to have a team and investors specifically that understand that. And then lastly, it, they just take more time. So this is not a, you know, investors that, you know, expect to put their uh, investment in and then in a year and a half, try to flip it. It's, it's just not the model that works for science and engineering translation. So we hope to bring this experience um, to undergraduates by having them uh, serve as great innovation interns and help us work with grid funded accelerator projects, put together the programs that we talked about, work with um, researchers in labs to design experiments and potentially even help them execute it if that's something that the, the students would like to do in terms of exposure to the translation of science. And then the first bullet point here, Fusion Fellows, um, we are gonna launch a PhD like program. It'll be a one year fellowship. And the idea is, and we're gonna start very narrow. And what I mean by that is we're gonna start with Harvard PhDs that wanna translate their own science or have partnered with a PI to translate science from that lab with the support of the PI. Uh, and that we they will spend a year with us and we will give them that sort of boot camp, that sort of white glove um, boot camp mentoring. We'll you know, put together a structured program through the course of the year. And think of it this way, we're calling it a fusion fellowship because you know, as fusion is, particles will come together sort of and create an explosive growth. 
Uh, and that, that, you know, in the case of fusion, it's energy that we're trying to harness. In the case of the Grid Fusion Fellows, is that at the end of a one-year um, Grid Fusion Fellowship, you have some of the key elements that you might need to launch your idea. So you've de-risked the idea in the in the lab. So that's the lab-based piece. You've uh, you've spoken with venture capitalists. You might even have a term sheet that you're ready to sign. You've spoken with the Harvard Licensing Office, our OTD, um, to sort of work out the terms and get a license in place to make that happen. If it's something that you have an immediate customer for, then you might even have an LOI or potentially a purchase agreement if you can think that, or if you're able to get that far down the road. If it's something that needs to be built, then you have um, some idea of a supply chain and putting together a supply chain. A team, you know, I've said this already four times that it takes a village. So you've already sort of figured out where the gaps are, what you need to get the idea launched, and you've already approached interviewed and you have people that are willing to join the team. So think of those sort of are the particles that come together in fusion and the explosion that you get at the end is a sort of full baked and you know ready to launch startup. So those are two programs I'm working on. I'm, I'm, I'll be pitching them to our dean next in two weeks and I hope to go, uh, get funding. And what, what you know these um, the grid is funded by philanthropy um, so, and we're funded for five years and that's a great luxurious position. I wouldn't have taken this job if I had to go out and ask for money. Um, but uh, at least as job number one, but I'm going to rob a little bit from our future. So I, I won't have a full four and a half or five year window because I'm going to launch these programs right away. In fact, we've already hired some innovation interns. Don't tell my dean, please, because I'm going to haven't yet asked for permission, but um, we're going to hire. We've already hired uh, innovation interns, uh, but the, the fellowship, I certainly need to bring them under the tent before we launch this postdoc type program. But the funding for it will come from the grid's future. So I'm sort of stealing from our future to launch these now. But I, you know, I think if we do this well, um, I don't think it'll be a challenge to show to um, an alum or someone who would like to support these ideas to say that, you know, this is important. Look at the results, and you know, this is something that uh, we would love to get philanthropic support to fund um, more sustainably and in perpetuity. Sort of the next idea, you may be familiar with the engine. It's a tough tech venture capital firm here. Its original genesis of founding story was that MIT wanted to translate more ideas from their lab. So, and the two pieces they identified that were missing were space and funding. So that's exactly what they did. They created the engine, they got a, they rented a warehouse and, and MIT funded it initially. Um, and it served as a dedicated um, or bespoke uh, venture capital firm to launch ideas from MIT. And so, you know, I, I hope to learn a lot more about that. It's since evolved dramatically. Harvard happens to be an LP. We work very closely with the engine. And in fact, we have multiple startups from Harvard Labs that are in their space and have been funded out of their fund. Um, so there are a lot of things we'd like to, to, to learn from that. But fundamentally, I think Grid 3.0 is going to have some semblance of space and I hope some um, much more aggressive and by my meaning much larger <clears throat> funding capability. So in the end, what are we trying to do? Uh, inspire ideas, uh, you know, that there, if you're a PhD student here doing research in, in a Harvard lab, that there's more than two paths. Today, traditionally, we think about options as going into academia or potentially going into industry. And there may be two or more paths in the middle. One is launch your own research or launch other tech research because you're at a great point in your career where um, this may be the, the most opportune time to do so. And this idea, you know, as an electrical engineer, I love to use this term, we reduce activation energy. So it's sort of lift that electron, um, you know, from one band to, uh, to an outer band or even to lift it out uh, of those bands altogether. The activation energy, our goal is to lower it to practically nothing such that you feel you are empowered. You have the tools, you have the ideas, and you see the path to lift your ideas uh, out of the lab and then support you uh, along that way and along that journey. I, you know, I've been asked about what success looks like, and uh, the short answer is don't know, and I'm still devising those. You know, the uh, GRID is a joint uh, venture, a collaboration between the engineering school and our Office of Tech Development. So, you know, you can you can think of direct measures like the number of um, proposals or interests we get for our granting mechanism, the number of startups that are launched, um, the number of, you know, students who attended a boot camp and that went on to start a business you know, with uh, their work um, from the lab. Um, and then even further downstream, you know, if, we, if we could actually look at funds raised, you could look at acquisition amounts, you could look at IPO amounts. So you could go much further downstream and try to sort of tie um, some of that downstream success to some of the work that we do here, if you think that's a relevant way to measure our, our work. But then there's indirect measures. We used the word community earlier. And this idea of sort of polishing the shine of, of culture here at uh, uh, the startup culture or translation culture here at the engineering school. 
you know, how, how do you measure that? And ac activity is an absolute terrible measure. Um, but, you know, maybe we're going to have to have su uh, some activity measures like um, uh, what response are we getting from faculty and, and, and PhD and postdoc students um, at different events and who's attending and why are they attending and how regularly are they attending? So TBD, and if you have ideas, we'd love to hear them. We'll be chatting here in just a moment. Now, back to what I said at the very beginning. What are we doing? I said basically the 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 start of the the start of the idea is that a Harvard PhD chemist and a Harvard PhD biophysiologist walk into a bar. On the left, you see Dr. Christina Chang. Um, she is the um, Harvard PhD chemist, and she's now a venture capitalist with uh, Laura Carbon. Um, and they led Tender's twelve million dollar seed round. And uh, Tender is led by Dr. Christoph Chantre. He's a biophysiologist um, from Kit Parker's lab here. And they are using plant-based materials, and they have a very novel technique developed in the lab here to spin that into what looks, smells, and tastes like uh, pulled pork. So, you know, this idea of plant-based alternatives to meats or meat alternatives that are plant-based, um, there's a lot of really impressive work, and Tinder is leading the charge in that. You can you can purchase their product in one retail outlet and and several uh, restaurants here in the uh, in the Boston area. So. Um, that's that's sort of the punchline. That is exactly what we hope to be the punchline for uh, sort of the uh, the success of the grid. So that's it. I'm sorry I talked a lot longer than I hoped. Um, and you know the idea of success. What does it look like? What should we be doing more of? Or stop doing? Uh, or stop doing? That's fundamentally um, what I hope to uh, learn and hear from you. Thank you for uh, for the soapbox and thank you for listening. Oh, that was that was wonderful. Thank you. So so many things you're doing. This is incredible. Yes. Maybe that's part of the problem. Who knows? That's what I would love to hear your thoughts. Yeah. So who has some questions or comments for Paul? Victor. Well, <clears throat> I'll start with a gratitude for coming and explaining to us what this is and what you're doing. It's it's fascinating to see. Um I don't have a question, but more of a comment that Please. it must be a dream come true for people who are involved in these, uh, I'll call them organizations or, or boot camps or any aspect that you've discussed and anything that might be coming. Um, normally in my uh, um, reception, you go through college at, at whatever level and you go out into industry, as you said. But this um, this is really fascinating in terms of not only feeding uh, technology and, and ideation for societal good, but actually launching businesses, giving giving folks that are ready and ideas that are ready the the launching pad into into commercialization. I'm not sure where the lines are drawn, and I'm not sure it matters. Um, what a phenomenal resource to be able to offer. Congratulations to you. Well, oh, thank you, Victor. That's a very kind comment. I appreciate the input. Uh, you know, the only quick thing that I'll say is that would you believe that one year ago, and before I started, I really vexed over the idea of should I join a big stodgy bureaucracy and you know work work in this environment where you know if everything works at a glacial pace. At least that's the conventional wisdom, right? But I'll say that it has been, it has proven entirely the opposite. You know. I, I've been given a lot of latitude to try to figure out. I know the objective, but I've been given a lot of latitude to try to figure out how to do it. And that's partly why I'm saying I would welcome your input on it. So, but thank you for that comment, Victor. Nicholas, please. Yeah, so my question is, um, you know, in, in academic research, there's a lot of collaboration across universities or maybe not a lot of collaboration across universities. Uh, how does this, you know, compete with that? And and do you think that this is going to have a uh, better network effect that, or a better um, collaborative environment than working with someone, you know, who's also a, an expert but at a at a different school that you wrote a paper with? Yeah, multiple pieces to that. Um, let me say this: is that you know, it's funny when we put out the press release um, in September and launched the grid, a, a reporter came and wanted to talk to us, and you know. I, I just happened to be the, the new face, but there were a lot of people that had worked on this idea for two years prior, right? You know, putting together the idea and the plan. So I had a team of people that were there answering these questions, but she asked basically, you know, are you playing catch up to like MIT down the street? And this may be only part of your question, but I think 
And the comment there, it was, it's a good comment in that we, we did feel like that we had more opportunity to, to launch ideas from Harvard Labs. So that's the narrow focus from Harvard Labs, that there, there was an opportunity to do more work. Um, so, you know, that fundamentally is true. So we, like I said, we do translation, but there's a deeper well to pull from. Now in the collaboration, I'm not sure if I'm going to answer that your question directly, Nicholas, so, so please, uh, please poke back. But A, the first thing I did was go to other places that are held out examples of doing it well, MIT and Stanford notably. Um, and as I mentioned, my undergraduate was Cornell. So there's a lot of interesting things that Cornell's doing and it's a much bigger engineering college than we are here a school at Harvard. Um, and I took notes on, you know, what 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 is the secret sauce that's working there? And I, then my job was also to try to figure out how to extrapolate it back because what might work well at MIT may not work well at Harvard. So um, I certainly, like I said, in the spirit of not inventing, went to places that are held out as examples of doing this well. Now, and then maybe a third piece of your question, and again, tell me if I missed it, <laughs> the main point, but maybe the third piece is this collaboration. Is like, um, maybe by example, the Wies Institute is a Harvard Institute, but it, its point is interdisciplinary research. So you'll have a Harvard professor collaborating with an MIT professor, and therefore the IP that's generated will be jointly owned by Harvard and MIT. So in that sense, again, I I, I will say, I, uh, you know, we do have blinders that our role is to launch Harvard Science and Engineering, but it's perfectly fine if that Harvard Science and Engineering uh, goes hand in hand with MIT Science and Engineering because the collaborators work together and the IP, therefore, is jointly owned. You know, like, for instance, I if, if we decide to, uh, to issue an accelerator grant, we would hope that MIT might sort of, you know, pony up commensurately so that, you know, we're not solely funding joint IP, but um, but that's absolutely something that we would love to do and support. Uh, I hope, is that partly what you were talking yeah, about? Yeah, no, you, you, got my, you got my question exactly. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Rosa, please. Yeah, thank you, Paul, for uh, this exciting journey that you are in. And I believe so many in this group is going to use and, and be part of it in the future. Okay. I would like to know if you have thinking and a strategy on how to escalate and digitalize that to make it more accessible for everybody that is not in Boston or not at Harvard. Yeah, so part of it, and it's partly by design, and this is, I, I sort of touched on this a little bit when we, when Susan asked her question about, you know, could HBAP alums, as an example, participate in um, in the affairs of the grid? And, and candidly, the short answer is there's, there's a lot of ways for alums to plug into the life of Harvard. Our focus is to translate Harvard IP fundamentally. So that means I work with faculty and their students to translate that their work. But as I said, we can't do that alone. And, you know, uh, and I'm also, you know, I, I hired a program manager, but we're two people. So there's no way we could support the scale at the scale that we need to. So the way that we fix that is that I tap all my friends and family, so to speak, you know, um, it takes a village. So we have, I, I, you know, I collect, we've had a lot of inbound as an example, when we made the, the announcement of the grid, notably from investment firms that want to, you know, say, look, hey, here's three things that I invest in. When you see it, give me a call. And so I need to, I'm, I tr I don't yet have the best answer on how to be responsive to that. We're going to plug in a Salesforce uh, database and I'll tag all these things. So hopefully I can do some clever searching. But long story short, absolutely, Rosa, is that, you know, uh, that's what I, we need to pull people in from industry that are, you know, already researching and or applying ideas in areas that we are trying to invent as well. Because uh, it can't happen in a box and won't be successful in a box and we'll maybe bring something out of the box and find that it's not useful because there's already great ideas out. So we have to find a way to plug in um, outside ideas and input. And I would not say that I do that very well today. Um, and it's very ad hoc, uh, you know, but I've been a little hesitant to run forward and just put, um, like a lot of organizations will put their advisors or entrepreneurs in residence or, you know, XIRs, there's a lot of those programs and they put people's faces on websites and, and you know, people love to have the relationship, but I don't want to do that unless I can find a way to make that meaningful. And in many places you end up, it ends up being just a face on a website. And so I think that lets down both the person who is bringing their expertise, but also the students that, you know, are either not uh, appropriately or fairly or, you know, sufficiently tapping that. So I haven't figured out the right answer yet. And that's why you won't see a list of, um, of, of partners beyond uh, the, the logos of the organizations on their website. 
So I'm sorry for that long-winded answer. The no, short no, answer no, is, is that we need to do a better job in that regard. And I would, you know, looking for the right model still. Okay, thank you. Dean. Oh, uh, yeah, great presentation. Um, boot camps, uh, brilliant yeah. idea. Um, I, I just from experience, um, a little hackathon, I think you called it, like they had like a hack, right? So just join on, on experience, um, we just recently did like a hackathon in, in the company that I'm the chief data science and, and co-founder that got bought. So I've been all those guys that, that have been there and we're good and bad, that Kelly and I know very well. Um, man, did Microsoft and AWS and the big, big companies support us? It was incredible. So just I'm thinking when you do like the hack thing, those companies desperately want to help uh, companies with their, you know, with their tech. And so they sponsored breakfasts, lunches, taught free sessions on how to use certain tech like Azure, AWS, um, uh, Snowflake, and 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 we used their technology. So they they really wanted to, it was much more, oh, don't, don't get the business side, but how the, using their tools. And some of the, you know, PhD students may not even be exposed to some of the tooling that they could use to accelerate machine learning AI. And that we got taught that. So we used, like we, our theme was generative AI. That was our theme. And we came up with 15 different groups and and um, and now two of them are going to market. Wow. So that wow. hack, bringing things together, oh my God, from different groups and even bringing, like I say, just a little bit of education session on how to use a tech, it's, it's incredible. So yeah. strongly recommend that sort of hack you. thing that you're talking about would be very, very, very good. And don't not think about the big, big players that can come in to help and sponsor and dollars to help. Thank you, Dean. You know, I, I've never hosted or designed a hack myself, so I'm going to need to lean on uh, other authority here. Um, our idea was sort of one company bring a device and we break into teams and, and invent it. But um, the sponsorship angle also is something that... Uh, no, I totally look, honestly, yeah. they will be all over, especially with Harvard too. And um, they and I've got budgets for this. Yes. Um, yeah. But more importantly, it was the education session. So we, you run it over a period, a build up about three weeks, have these education sessions, and then... Um, and then you go, and then you go, and then you have these ideas, and you form the groups, and then you have a series of X. You know, we did it over thirty six hours, yeah. and and a presentation, and it, it's judged. And I tell you what, you go for it, and it's it's so exciting. And what we built, we built an AI model, uh, machine learning model. We built a, a chat bot, general generative chat bot, in thirty six hours. It's incredible what you come up with. So very happy to. To uh, Kelly's, got my dad, very happy to sort of guide you on how that would work because it's bloody successful. I will be in touch, Dan. It, it took one or two notes also. I like this lead up idea too, because well, part yes. of what we're thinking is that, you know, there would need to be some kind of training to understand the product, the industry. Yeah, you do. You build stuff. it up, get them set yeah. up the rules and so on. And, and then, like I said, like, depending yeah. on what it is, um, very happy to help and say, this is how I would do it if I was in your shoes. Fantastic. Thank you. I'll All be in right. touch. Divya. Hey, Paul. Good to hey, see you. Good to see you. All right. This is more a broad stroke kind of um, IP question, just out yeah. of curiosity, right? Like all of this is research that fundamentally is grant driven, which the university owns a good stake of. How does that ownership kind of come into play when you're starting to think about building out these companies, right? Like there is so much of kind of that almost that push and pull of the university wanting to own a lot of the IP and hence the research and hence the product to then the people who conducted the research to own who actually will own the product itself as they build and then you're bringing all these people in so where and like just from a dynamics perspective like you said right like it is the academic institutions hold on to their IPs very closely. So as you are getting more of these PhDs to come out of their shell and build these products, but fundamentally the university still wants to own <laughs> yes. a lot of what's going out into the market, right? Like, so then you have the venture capitalists who want to come in, you want to still encourage the researchers themselves to still be vested. How does that all play out, Paul? 
Yes, you know, it is it is a dance at different stages. But, you know, one thing I'll say, Debbie, is that pre-license agendas are very well aligned because, you know, pre-license. And, and so, by the way, let me let me just step back and say that the grid is focused on Harvard IP only. Right. Yeah. So yeah. we have a lot of people that come to us from the medical school. They found us. In fact, Kelly um, uh, brought a physician from one of the teaching hospitals associated with HMS. And so, listen, uh, I, I say no to, to I never say no. No, is not in my vocabulary. So I'm happy to help anyone in any way. Um, but the grid's function is to translate Harvard science and engineering. Said another way, the grid's function is to translate, get uh, Harvard's IP and get it out to in, into a startup or a license. And believe it or not, but for a license, everyone is more or less aligned because the idea is to protect it as best you can um, via IP or you know, know-how, whatever the right answer is, protect it. And here's the thing, if you're a PhD researcher or you're even a faculty member, that's not your forte. You know, mm -hmm. We're talking IP law now at this point. And so that's what our uh, Office of Tech Development is, is really adept at, is coming in, working, understanding the science and the tech, working with outside counsel mm -hmm. as well to figure out how do we take these ideas? What is the impact implication? What do we need to protect? What does this strategy look like? And by the way, and they pay the bill. So mm -hmm. you know, these are things that probably wouldn't happen well or happen at all uh, for, for a numerous set of reasons. So in the beginning, it's pretty well aligned. There, there is a negotiation at the time of licensing, and that's between Harvard and uh, the start. Let's say it's a startup. So that would be between Harvard and the startup. And usually it's the investors that are involved. And we do often ask the faculty member to not play a role because then there is, a you know, then you start to introduce a lot of, you know, um, there's multiple hats that are worn. So you will really want to just kind of keep it clean in that regard. But in the end, if that IP is not licensed and doesn't end up in a startup, everybody loses yeah that's starting true. with harvard so um so i think you'd find that incentives are pretty well aligned throughout the process and by the way i'll just say that you know when i started here everyone was like you 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 also reporting to otd uh, you know licensing offices or owners at universities and all this other stuff listen maybe you know um uh their flavors of onerousness and i'd say generally um it's not a template, but you know our team here has done this a lot for a long. Most of my colleagues have been in the office of tech development for five or fifteen years, right, or in the in that range. So, I think you'll find that you you get to an answer that works for everyone pretty quickly. Awesome. And do you think that's also different between schools? So you kind of probably find a little bit more people <laughs> working in from an engineering perspective versus someone from the medical school. <laughs> I'd say, you know, oh, boy, oh uh, sorry, I, I was thinking like MIT, and it's funny because um, I met with one of my OTD colleagues in a, yeah. in a venture firm, and they asked exactly that, and he worked at MIT's OTD before, um, and he said that. He said, basically, we're all the same. We all talk to each other, so there are not a lot of secrets, and so, you know, if nobody's, we all know what market is, and, you know, we all know it doesn't serve anyone's purpose, so we all um, are in good shape, um, and then second, um, it's funny though, and don't tell anyone I said this, but one of my startups, we licensed tech from one of the hospitals. And I will tell you through the eyes of someone on the receiving side, and I've heard this, so I feel a little more comfortable saying this publicly, the the, o, the OTD offices in some of the hospitals are a bit ornery, let's just say that. Yeah, no, I yeah. <laughs> <laughs> don't tell anyone i said that can we nope, we're gonna have to cut that from the recording it. also susan that out. <laughs> yeah that, we're gonna have to cut that out from this recording too please uh, yeah we'll <laughs> thank you that out. thanks for yeah. the question divya susan please yeah so i mean just so incredible what what you're doing and so you've done a ton in one year uh, an enormous amount so my question is what are your what were your key takeaways like your key aha moments and learnings over the past year? First off, a little bit of validation, right? Because I came to this with somebody else's idea that Harvard needs to do more of this, and you know that you know and and the buy-in. And the great thing is that we had support from the dean here, and um, so so we had I had great support. I had great tailwinds. But I would say one thing that has been a bit of an aha, but also absolutely validating is the response from the community. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I knock on lab doors, I knock on professors doors, I, I knock on lab doors, go to lab meetings. We've been hosting all those events that you you saw and the response from students. Um, 
was, you know, and Victor said very kind things at the very, very beginning of this. Uh, but we've heard that from some students, like, where have you been all my life kind of thing? Mm -hmm. You know, those that have been here for a few years. And then those are like, I, you know, I'm very grateful for the chance to get to have this conversation with you. And, and you know, you connected me with this person in this industry and, and so on. And, and, you know, that never would have happened kind of thing. So those kinds of things, Susan, those are both ahas and wildly validating that we're, we're starting to head down the right path in terms of what the what will work for the community. So we love that. And I'm sorry, there was a second part also of your, your question. Oh, just um, lessons learned. So the other, the flip side. Lessons learned. So, so far, ex our experimentation um, has basically told us that we need to continue them because we're still learning a lot. You know, it's funny. Uh, oh, here, I'm struggling a bit to get something specific. So let me give you a specific example. At the last Venturing at Harvard event, you remember that's the one I described. It's the it's the weekly thin, unstructured. It's the community for Venturing at Harvard. At that, I had two people come up to me and say, that validating thing, which is I met a co-founder at this event last time. So we come to every one of them, um, you know, and this, someone else came up to me and said, you know, said I met someone and we can, we're, you know, continuing to have a dialogue now about doing something together. So fantastic, right? So I'm on cloud nine. Then two people came up to me and said, these things are fun, but they're not structured right. Well, I'm not meeting people. It's, you know, how do I, there's 60 people here. How am I supposed to find a person that fits. And then someone else came to me afterwards. I'm thinking, all right, I need someone to tell me again, this is working. But they said the same thing. They're like, you, you know, this is fun. Thank you. But how am I supposed to find, you know, the needle in the haystack here? So <laughs> it's funny that, you know, um, we, we do, I think we will dabble in the idea. There are a lot of simple ideas, right? I think we've been to sessions where, you know, when you walk in, maybe you put a different color uh, a dot on your a sticker on your name tag. And then you have those people together, or you just have people segregate by industry. Maybe, you know, physically we break up the room. So there, there are lots of ideas on how we can try to force a little bit more or less organic, but force more um, connections at those kinds of things. So, you know, that's what we've learned also. Um, I think we've also like the, 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 at the lab to market session that we had today, most people showed up to listen. Mm -hmm which is interesting. I had to pull teeth today. So we had a full room, by the way, in the note. So we had, you know, about 20 people. And they're, these are designed to be like 12 to 15 because we try to keep them as round tables. And that idea of intimacy is also important in what we're trying to do and lower the barrier. But so we had about 20 people. And so I said, all right, and we introduced our three serial entrepreneurs. We went out of the room just so everyone can frame who they are and what they're, you know, doing so that, you know, we could ask each other questions. Um, nobody has a corner on ideas. Uh, or the right ideas or best ideas. But then I said, all right, the floor is yours. And guess what? Crickets, crickets. <laughs> and I was like, people, what's on your mind? Ask what everything. I mean, if you want, ask what we should have for dinner tonight, but ask something. <laughs> <laughs> but so, you know, that was, but there was, some, that was interesting. And we advertise it that way too. Uh, I've said that to a lot of people. If you want to come listen to what other people are asking or what other people are doing, you're most welcome to do that. So, at first, I was a little bit sort of, uh, you know, I just tried to heckle the crowd, but then I realized that was a good and right thing for them, for people to do. This is part of culture, too. Showing up and asking. Cool. Kelly. Uh-oh, my friend Kelly. Hey. I'm scared right now. No, this is good. I, I'm. Thank you, Paul, for showing up. Uh, number one, for everybody on here, what you see is what you get with Paul. And I, and I will say he is he is probably the nicest person I've met at Harvard. And there's not a time I'm there where he and I don't sit down for a cup of coffee or for something to eat and kind of hang out for a bit of the day. And I and I would like to then offer in that regard, uh, many of us are going to be there in December. Um, so if you if you could make the time and uh, maybe we can get a group together that are going to be there, we can call kind of come over and hang out at uh, grid and have that cup of coffee with you. I would I would greatly appreciate that. Sounds fantastic. There's a good, what yeah. is it an HBAP uh, reunion or what is it? Yeah, something like that. Is a okay. what? What is? What do they call it, Susan? They're actually calling it an immersion for graduates. So we get to take more classes. <laughs> yes. Fantastic. Well, I yeah. would, would absolutely walk. As I tell everyone, I'm here every day, early and late. As I said, part of being physical, I think, is going to be important to being successful. So uh, we'll be ready and ready to welcome you guys to campus. So. At and, and the other thing, Kelly must be okay. drinking margaritas. Don't believe anything Kelly says, at least all the first part. 
<laughs> no, I had a I had a strawberry smoothie. That's about as, as about as alcoholic as I get nowadays. The uh, the uh, the other thing was, you know, to Simon, I spent time uh, with you that day on that startup boot camp, and uh, what an extraordinary transformational sort of day that was for me. And and Simon, I've talked about it many times. It's where we met Josh Krieger. Uh, one of the people we met there is a woman who was taking uh, the power of waves uh, and putting these devices in the ocean and trying to stop the, 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 the waves from destroying the coastlines. And in the process, uh, uh, capturing that energy and bringing energy to, to communities that don't have electricity. I mean, just extraordinary stuff and extraordinary yeah. people coming out of there. And wh what I found was the, the people that I talked to there really could have used some mentorship, especially in the business area. And you got people like Dean, who are full cycle entrepreneurs, who's been there, sold his company. And, uh, you know, you've got a lot of people on this call. Um, is there an opportunity, do you think, for HBAPers to actually engage with those folks and maybe provide some of that mentorship from an experience point of view? Yes, I think that, you know, that's the short answer is absolutely yes. I think Rosa was also, you know, asking around this, this idea, which is how do we bring that expertise to the table? And we have it on this call, as an example, as I look at the grid of all these wonderful people. Um, there is a wealth of expertise at this table that our students would definitely clamor to be engaged with. Um, I I haven't quite figured out the right way to do it, uh, Kelly. Like, for instance, at, at, in the spirit of um, uh, work at, let's see, we're, I for, I've forgotten now who asked the question about MIT. But um, one thing I also took away from them, they have an ILP, an industrial liaison program. It is like 50, 60 companies. It's a, They have like... 30 people that work in the office. It's a big organization. And I'll be candid. I absolutely eschew, eschew that idea. That's unappealing in how I think about building what the grid should be. We need to have industry. We need to have those players at the table, but creating that organization and having to build the administrative overhead to manage the care and feeding, only to disappoint, take a lot of money from them and then disappoint them. <laughs> you know, so, and, you know, for a lot of reasons, I just don't think that's the right idea. So anyway, the short answer is we absolutely could use the expertise around this table. And let's have that conversation when you come in December, too. Maybe we could put some structure and sort of organize it or institutionalize it in some way. Thank you, Kelly. Sounds like a plan. Thanks, Paul. I'll see you in a few weeks then. See you in a few weeks. Right. <laughs> Here's Ina. Yes, Paul. So I'm curious to hear... What surprised you the most coming from working in the industry and then going to work for such a famous education institution as Harvard? What can you share? What surprised you the most? What were you shocked about? First, that this wasn't here in spades. I mean, when you when you have a student say, you know, I'm, where have you been, Reese? You know, all my life, sort of thing. It's you're you're thrilled and happy to hear that. But the flip side of that is like, oh my goodness, you know, Harvard um, was lacking in this area. So you know, obviously, the the team, my colleagues here, were quite astute to say this is something that we need to double down on um, because it would be valuable. So that's one thing. Second is the, you know. I hesitated because I was worried about getting crushed by a bureaucracy. I'm a I'm a scrappy early stage, you know, guy. That's my mantra. That's who I am. Yeah, you can see how I operate. You see how I talk. You see how I think. Uh, I don't want to spend an entire day at a whiteboard. I want to spend the morning at the whiteboard and then go do it, and then we'll come back and be at the whiteboard and say, well, what worked, what didn't work. That's you know, <laughs> that's my approach. <laughs> so. so that's just who I am. I'm an engineer by training. This idea of tinkering is very important to me um, to figure things out. So, um, and I have that latitude so far. I'm one year into it, but I, I have that latitude, you know, and that is the beauty of this is that I'm sort of given a small uh, pot of money, um, given a beautiful perch in the engineering, the new engineering building and a mandate. And just basically I'm figuring it out. I get to do what I think will have impact. If it works, I'm doing more. And if it doesn't work, move on. All it cost me was pizza. <laughs> so I, I feel it, a bit of a position of luxury in that regard. And I've been I've been really thrilled. I thought I was it was going to be soul crushing sooner. And I hesitated. And now I don't know why I ever hesitated. Mm. Oh, interesting. So well, thank you for sharing. Well, You're for doing that. exciting things. I am excited to see what are you working on in December? Hopefully it will work out. Well, fantastic. You know, and please look at, you know, our website. We, as in the spirit of, you know, the grid is about promoting people, lighting paths for them, but also promoting them in their work. That's really what it's about. It's not about 
me or, you know, the, the grid itself. It's about promoting people. So if you go to our website, hopefully you'll see that, you know, you'll see at least 10 ish projects that we feature research projects. We're working very intimately with our faculty to um, help them lift those ideas. And the reason that we feature their work is because it's an open invitation to the world to say, if this is, if this resonates with you, if you can help with this, or if any way you want to be in touch with this work, let us know because that's what we need. That's exactly what we're inviting. Yeah. Thank you, Grisa. Um, Appreciate the question. Uh, so we have we have one more. We we have Lilith still and Paul. How are you doing for time? I'm good. Thank you. Okay. I talked way too much, so I'm I'll stay. <laughs> Lilith, please. Thank you. Uh, so just a quick question. Um, thank you so much for sharing your experience. And sorry about the background noise. I have my kids here. Um, you've been part of uh, various industries, right? From healthcare to solar energy, if I remember right. So what would you say, what would be the core principles you have um, found to be universal in driving innovation across those diverse fields? Yeah. Well, I thought you were going to ask a different question, you know, which is what is the thread that ties them together? And then my <laughs> wife would, you know, you, I already told you what my wife would say about that. <laughs> but to your better question, um, sort of, you know, sort of some principles, you know, one thing, two things I'll say. One, I'm a trained engineer. And you know what I suffered from for a long part of my life is that I have always been enamored with technology. I'm a technologist at heart. That's who I am. I was raised by an electro engineer and a math teacher. I, I just like tech, studied electro engineering myself. So we engineers often get enamored and therefore blinded by our, our own tech. And a different way to say that is that when you talk about what you're doing, if you're talking about the tech, then often you're probably missing the point. Or let's say, it, let's say it even a third way, if you're talking about tech, you're probably not getting the idea across to a broader audience or to the audience you're talking to. So that is one thing I have had to like beat this out of my head that it's really not about all the fancy stuff that I can do behind the curtain. That really is uh, not, not the crux of what I need to be communicating. So that, that's that's number one. Um, number two is this, this, you know, and I'm sorry if this is trite, but this customer focus, you know, I, you know, I will tell you, and I'm, let, me, let me just make a confession. My first medical device, so I, as I mentioned, I've been doing medical devices for about a decade. The first one we launched with our own technology with a scientist, a chemist, and that was 10 years ago, roughly. I'm still working on it. I had trouble getting it funded. I had trouble getting the idea launched and it dragged on. I shelved it and worked on other ideas and had some interim successes, but I'm still working on that first one. So the sequence is not even, you know, like start one, it failed or succeeded, start the next, it fails or succeeds. You know, it's not, it's not sequential even. Um, they're overlapping. And um I I wasn't close enough to the customer. I, you know, I had a customer that said, that's an interesting idea, but I wasn't really uh, relentlessly focused on like, where was the customer's hair on fire? That's some, and it, someone used that expression at one of our meetings recently. And um, I missed that in some of my first ideas. Uh, I, had, I had a great idea. I had a great technology, trust me. <laughs> but you know what? I was missing the customer with their hair on fire, or I hadn't figured out a way to to describe the problem where the customer's hair was on fire. And it cost me a lot of time. And you know, my first startup, I put a lot of time and effort and money into it, uh, the first med device, and I'm still working on it to this day. Um, it's, there's some reasons why I haven't killed it, but, um, but that was a harsh, les harsh, harsh lesson uh, to learn. And look, you know, it took me a long time to learn it. But this customer piece, be very close to your customer. And also know how to interpret what your customer says, because, you know, you know, this, you know, the saying, ask your mom, if, if I ask my mom, if I'm the best looking and smartest guy in the world she's ever met, you know, she's going to say, absolutely. <laughs> but you guys know, that's not completely true. Thank you so much. Um, a little comment on the success metrics. I wonder if you yeah. are actually, um, looking into job creation, right? And the number of jobs created mm -hmm. by the startups as a success metric or time to market came to mind when you were speaking as well, like the speed at which, you know, research is kind of translated into uh, actual products, right? And then the other part of it is more indirect, but the cultural shifts you see within the institution in terms of the partnerships, right? 
Bye. Yes. So maybe two two things that I'll say in that. One is that um, I would love to think bigger and broader, but I'll tell you, Lilith, you know, my charge is to translate Harvard Science and Engineering. So at least for the first few years, I need to be faithful to that. So it keeps my head down a little bit. Um, so job creation, as an example, is not a criteria um, in that regard. It's really launching IP um, and enabling our students to do what they want to do with their work, like launch it and become an executive. So in that sense, but that's but that's not really job creation. Um, you know, give me a, give me five, six years. I would love to have a relationship, town gown relationship and start acting in that way, too. Um, and then start using something like jobs as a uh, as a metric, a success metric, but it's beyond the scope of what the, the grid is charged with today, candidate. So in that sense, a little bit narrowing, but that's that's our focus. Um, oh, the second piece, I'm so sorry. Um, Lil Helby, what was the second piece? Everybody? Time to, to uh, time to market. Yes, time to market. Um, but what about time to market? Uh, more looking at the speed, you know, how how much it really takes from research to the product. Yes. I guess the way we, we think about that is that, you know, like our, we don't do research. I'm, I'm not a researcher and the grid is not in the business of research. So if there is something that is still a little bit too distant from some sort of commercial model or commercial prototype or commercial viability, then candidly, that's not something the grid will spend its time on. So that's why when we say de-risking, we think of it, A, in that, you know, you need to sort of, it should be fundable at the end, and the end is the end of one year. So that's that's sort of the time point where we kind of, now we're, we're happy to help shape, like for instance, if you, we have the flexibility to shape the next research project in a way that solves, you know, a little bit more solves that need than our, you know, and our researchers inclined to do so, then happy to do it. But by the way, I sit in a, science and engineering research institution, there are faculty that want to push the frontiers of science and have no interest in commercialization. And that's perfectly fine. They're just not partners that I will spend time and energy working with. That's not their interest. My job is not to convince them that we have to launch their work. My job is to support those that want to commercialize their work, just to be clear. And I did think of one other thing that you mentioned, Lilith, is that this idea of partnerships only not even five or maybe eight years ago was a bit of an anathema in an in academic institution. The idea of bringing the, a commercial aspect under the tent is was a complete anathema. That's true at most major universities. Um, what well, that was true for a long time. Obviously, those things are changing. We have we've done a complete about face. In fact, our provost's office is convening a team on how Harvard should think more and better and differently about industry partnerships. It's because we have done a little bit of an about face of it in that specific regard. And now, I mean, for what I do, it's absolutely essential. What you, what this group has said is that we need your help. We can't do what we do without the external influence and, and, and expertise. All right, Susan, I think you've been trying to shut me up now for a few minutes. Uh, well, there's one more question if you're, if you're up for it and then let's make that our last one. And then- All right. Taufik. Uh Hi, Hi. Uh, Paul. Thanks so much uh, for the heads up. Um, I mean, I'm See also in the academia. I'm also <laughs> in the industry. So I'm a, um, a um, what do you call scholar practitioner. All right. Um, I went to a, um, a conference in um, Europe this uh, this year, and I attended a program in Europe, uh, the Triple Helix. And Triple Helix, as they, they're called, and they are doing similar thing, but they are actually linking from the university to governments as well as the industry. So they kind of have that kind of, uh, they call it the triple helix model. And they kind of look at what the, the three are doing, rolling out what the researchers are doing, what the industry wants and uh, in a kind of thing. Uh, is this a, a part of that? Because they always talk about the third mission of the university is actually to serve the society. So how does that relate with that? Because they, in Europe, seem to have formed that, and it's kind of a wheel that's been in Europe for a while, which actually also drives the educational system where they do the apprenticeship and some other stuff. So does it link, or is this uh, something totally different from that? 
No, I think I think those ideas are right on. I AI, you know, will reiterate that for us to be successful, it's going to take a village. That means we need to have industry at the table. We need to have investors at the table. Um, you know, we need to have other research institutions, as someone else has pointed out, you know, at the table. We we need to have the right people to help shape these ideas and get them launched. So that's definitely um going to be part of it. And I like this like triple helix idea. Um, is that you know the we, we call them pillars. You could call it the triple helix. I, I, I like that's the right idea is that you need to have these ingredients at the table because like like we're saying, a, if a de-risking project means someone's warm and ready and waiting uh, in the outside world when you're done, that means you have to have already spoken to them, pre-wired them, understood what their, their thresholds are and that you use that as your target. Otherwise, you're going to be like, you're going to be way off in left field when they're like waiting and receiving on way out in right field. So um, I like that idea. I'll look it up. It's a triple helix conference, if I understood you correctly. So yeah, is a is a triple helix. Maybe I'll check one of their website and I'll throw it in the uh, in the chat. But, thank you. That'd be terrific. Yeah. But that, I think that's the right idea. You need to yeah, bring together you. these pillars, these helixes, whatever you want to call them. That's the right idea. Yeah. Thank you. So Paul, there's one more in the chat that snuck under just before we. We close the gate. So from Swapnil, do you see that? Yes. What is the ratio of funding uh, from grants free like NSF, NIH, DOE, DOD, et cetera, from funding to industry projects? Uh, Swapnil, I do not know a ratio because what I do is all, you know, I have my own kitty and all of our faculty, you know, apply for grants. You know, much of their work is, is grant funded. Um, so I do not know the answer to that. Um, and in fact, there, you can apply for our grant and, and also be applying for other grants as well. There's We don't require exclusivity in that regard. In fact, we think it, you know they're complementary. And the more money you have, as long as it doesn't sort of bind you to uh, to one specific uh, conclusion, um, then, then certainly you know apply for as, as many grants. But I don't know the ratio. I have no idea. In fact, I'm not sure you will find consistency in that as well. But I, I don't know. I'm guessing. Sorry, I was not turn to speak at a seven-year-old sleeping, yeah, trying to sneak in in my room and listen to this conversation. So here she's welcome. Love to see yeah. you. <laughs> but the 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 only reason I you know something you said and you know just prompted me to ask that question. The reason I, you know, the free money, right? If you are getting a lot of free money, there is no real forcing function to develop something useful right away. When the industry gives you money. Right, it is for a product. It's for something linked to revenue. There's already directly a forcing function to have something more commercial, right? So I was just wondering, you know, Howard, with its reputation, is it getting too much free money, the grant money? Because you know, it's it goes towards science, right? It may not have immediate technology or a product use, right? Yeah. So that, that that's why I was just trying to ask that question. Like, do you know what that ratio looks like? It's a great question. You know, I remember, I don't know, maybe. 10, 12 years ago, before my first uh, medical device, I looked at a lot of different things. And one thing that I looked at was an O2 sensor, uh, an oxygen sensor from a, a, a researcher at MIT. And he was debating between applying for a grant and sort of fine tuning the tech or thinking about how to turn it into a wearable um, that could potentially you know, be used. And I knew nothing about that. I just did a quick Google search and I saw one of the big Korean conglomerates, you know, I can't remember if it was Samsung or one of the others, but one of them was talking about launching an oxygen sensor. And I basically, I was like, it strikes me I, as a guy who's, you know, knows nothing about this, but it strikes me that if you apply for this grant, you're going to have your head down in your lab for two years. And when you lift your head up after two years, because, you know, if you take grant money, you need to be faithful to what you commit to. And so there's, there's lots of upsides and downsides of that. Um, but you have to be faithful to what you commit to. And if you stick your head up in two years, I think you might find that, you know, the world would have changed in the field of O2 sensing. If what I'm reading on this press release from Samsung is going to, is really going to happen. So I think there's, there is, there is risk in that regard, but, um, but frankly, you know, money to support your research is really hard to turn down and you, you can't launch a venture, um, and distract a team that you committed to a grant um, while you have it. Um, but if you have other people in the lab, you potentially could do things. Again, you just have to be faithful to the grant, but you 
uh, you know, potentially could try to find ways to launch some tech if it's not related to the grant uh, in parallel. But it's risky. You have to be careful, Swapno. You're, I think you're, you're, I've identified an interesting point. A, it's time consuming to write for grants, but then also report. But B, you're married to the plan until you, uh, you know, if you take the money. Yeah, thanks, Paul. Well, well, so on that note, we'll close. And Paul, thank you so much. This was just incredible and super excited to, to see you in December and talk about how we might help you all. And uh, so now we're going to go into overtime. So we're going to stop the recording. Uh, but just before that, just a reminder to everybody else, next week we have Neville Boston, who is the founder of Reviver, who was the first company to, to create and distribute digital license plates. So lots of really cool technology, but also like think about all the customization you can do on your license plate if it's digital. So he's going to be here next week to talk about his journey. And Susan, if I may, I just want to say thank you. The engagement, the questions, um, the fact that you joined to listen. Uh, thank you. I took some notes and we have a date in December. Look forward to uh, continuing. Thank you, everyone. And thank you for the invitation again to do this. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I, 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 thought I, I shared the link. You can check the chat. It's That's in the it. chat. Yep. Sophie, thank cool. you. All right. So we're going to stop recording. And Paul, you're welcome to stay.